Where's the beat? Okay, okay, let's go, let's go. Do you want to interview him or no? I'm just going to do an interview. Give me 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, mate. Can we start that bit again? Yeah. What you're getting is what you're getting. Oh, man, that's my son. That's why it's important when you edit this stuff, you know, the crappy bits you get rid of, you know, the stuttering, you know all that, though, don't you? We were born British citizens and we were more British than the British. But yeah, the thing to do with Saint Paul was bad. Bigger, round the corner, colored, black. You know, the reggae music, the Jamaican music, I play in the ghetto, you know. They call us the happy people because every weekend we have parties. Saint Paul's is one of the poorest areas in Bristol. We're a lower class right now and a lot of people love to be middle, let alone high. Most of the black people who live in St. Paul's right now are virtually families. I love St. Paul. We are all human beings, yeah? And that's really what this whole story is about. It's a human story. In 1948, the British Empire extended an invitation to its colonies in the Caribbean. In a formidable campaign, the Empire machinery courted British subjects from the West Indies, promising the opportunity to come to the motherland and realise their dreams. England is your mother country and we need you. And therefore, if you get the chance to go to England, you would be glad. You know, everybody was coming to England. So we were sort of brainwashed. You couldn't think of anything else but going to England. A long transatlantic journey brought the first party of Jamaicans to Britain. Following in their wake, families from the Jamaican districts of Clarendon and St. Thomas settled in the St. Paul's suburb in Bristol, England. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-servicemen who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sailed for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Some plan to return to Jamaica when conditions improve. Some will go into industry, others intend to rejoin the services. Deep in the heart of the West Country, where the River Avon and Froome meet, an ancient bridge has been linking lands and people for centuries. A town built around this bridge, a meeting point for merchants, farmers, transatlantic traders, the bridge town, Bristol. In the 18th century, St. Paul's was the location of choice for the wealthy slave trading merchants. It was laid down as Bristol's finest area by those making fortunes through the trade in black Africans. Bristol, from its centre, went out maybe a mile, if that. And then when the trade came in with Bristol, had a lead in, yeah, and had a huge chunk of this trade, then Bristol grew, and St. Paul's grew out of that. Bristol, the cornerstone of the slavery triangle, quickly became flooded with wealth. Wealth that was used to build splendid university buildings, concert halls, theatres and churches. A century and a half later, after England had been bombarded by Nazi planes, Bristol and most of St Paul's was left in rubble. Residents who could move out to safer suburbs did so, and after the war, refurbishment of the bombed houses was held up because the plans for the area were never realised. Neglected and forgotten, St Paul's was a no man's land.
it was quite a, a shocking experience really coming over from Jamaica and arriving in England. The English who had nice houses, they didn't want to rent us any houses. They, they put in their windows, no colored, that's us, no dogs, no Irish. I, I, was, I was surprised, man. I was surprised to see the houses then. There was no bathroom. The English used to wash as far as possible in a little tin. The kitchen sink, we are not used to that. Well, as an estate agent who knows St. Paul's pretty well, uh, it's pretty well come to the end of its useful life. Here, within a few hundred yards of where I'm speaking now, there are families living in these semi-derelict houses. Two and three bedroom houses with 20 and 30 people living in them. St. Paul's quickly became the only affordable place for the hopeful new arrivals. They had to get better houses in St. Paul's because, I mean, these houses are disgraceful. Look at them. St. Paul's is a pretty depressing place in many ways to live in. Just when the heart of all these prestigious properties was dying, the Afro-Caribbeans came with new life. In a weird twist of history, the arriving immigrants, all descending from slaves, occupied the houses that once belonged to the merchants that traded them like cattle. I know that a house that I bought the flat in definitely came from the proceeds of a merchant through the trade. And yeah, when I owned it, it's a bit like, yeah, I've owned it back. I own this now. I took something back, in a sense. It's come round and from being a person who was enslaved on a boat, maybe part of my ancestors and whatever went through them. Look how far I've come. Yeah, now I'm an owner. I got a piece of what you have. Do you think when they built this, they ever envisaged us as owners? With this thing, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. In the 1960s, Martin Luther King sparked the civil rights movement in the United States. I was committed to what Luther King was doing, so I decided we'd do something here about it, because this was a de facto segregation of city. In those years, it was rampant. It was wide. You couldn't, you couldn't move one way without you face racism. Yes, brother. Okay. We, were, we were looked down on, in simple term. Yeah. We were looked down on, you know, as nobody. Black people couldn't get a proper job in Bristol here because of racial prejudice. We used to call it color bar. I decided that I would go for drawing attention to racism, taking on the Bristol Bus Company because it was the most powerful employer in the, in the city at that time. I mean, you come to look at it this way, when old Beechin drops his hatch, there ain't going to be enough work for the whites, let alone the blacks. we got enough for our job now to get a working wage. If we don't get our bit of overtime, we can't live. If they come down here, they'll work all hours God give them. They were just saying, we don't, if they want blacks, don't have them, we don't have them. We should be all up out of work if they start coming on. They'll start ruling the country before long, won't they? What would you think about coloured people coming to work on the buses? I don't like the idea very much. Why not? I wouldn't like to work with them at night. There was no law against racial discrimination. No, you weren't protected by laws. There weren't any. Well, I think the majority of them are just ignorant. This is and always has been a white man's country. Therefore, I'm sick of the arrogant attitude of coloured people in this country. There's a problem of unemployment at present, and if coloured people are employed on public transport, I will walk before I use them. So when I began the campaign, I asked Guy Bailey if I could use him to open up the debate and see if I can get him a job on the buses. He said he would. And so I set up an interview with the, with the management. Personally, I couldn't see it working out. It might, but it does, it does in other towns, but I don't think it would in Bristol, because I think the racial feeling is worse here than in, than in the other towns. Having already spoken to the director um, of the bus company to say, we got some, have you got any vacancies? He was saying, we've got plenty. So bring Guy Bailey out, we should be very happy. He didn't know we were two black people. Before, <laughs> okay. And so Guy Kate went in. Mr. Bailey is here, but he's a black. He's black, he's a black man. And I could hear also that the, 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 the person in the other rooms saying, tell him that the vacancy is filled. The point is that whilst we can obtain white labor in this city, 
we intend to go on engaging white labour rather than coloured labour. Predictably, he was told he can't, he can't get the job. He don't take coloured. Mm -hmm. So I called him. I learned the, the technique of a boycott. The boycott that Luther King and Jesse Jackson were doing was the boycott I was going to bring to Britain. Don't use it. Don't use that facility. Leave it alone. The best boycott brought together blacks and whites in a fight against racism. The protest became part of a much wider movement. First time a prime minister in this country has actually supported a black-led campaign against racism. That's when Harold Wilson invited me down to Downing Street and told me there and then that if he gets to become prime minister, he, the first thing he would do in the first parliament was to put down a law say that racial discrimination was wrong. I am not prepared to stand aside and see this country engulfed by the racial conflict which calculating orators or ignorant prejudice can create. The battle against racialism here in Britain knows no boundaries and no limits. That is why I reject the attitude of those who with a lips, if not the votes, preach racialism at home. It had to change, and it did. On the day President Kennedy gave his backing to the American Civil Rights Movement, the Bristol Omnibus Company finally lifted its colour bar. They wanted us to win. They wanted it to happen. And it, and it happened. And for no reason, having acted in time, which we have, I believe, why we shouldn't overcome these very challenging, very important problems which are important to us and indeed to the whole of the world. Through tenacity and hope, West Indian for St Paul's kept winning personal battles. Princess got her job as the first black nurse in the South West. John Prescott trying to kiss me. Barrington created the first African and Caribbean dance company in the country. It was badly needed. It was needed for everybody to understand their African heritage, to understand how to dance in an African way. Raspandeli Selassie developed Bristol's Rastafarian Centre. Which is the revolution is in Jamaica. I am a freedom fighter in Jamaica. Mr Mack helped to build the first Jamaican carnival in the UK. A carnival that 40 years later will play host to more than 80,000 people. With all the um, national actors living in St. Paul's, we will get to know more about each other because by producing such a festival, we have to work together in very close contact and this should provide a great understanding for all. Back in the Caribbean, on August the 3rd, 1962, Jamaica won its independence. Here yeah, we are independence now. Independence are what? They are the one mess it up. England was the mother country. We were born British citizens. And for it to be taken away, it's as if we were downgraded, you know? Yeah, we were. And again, a part of the Commonwealth. What wealth? What wealth are you talking about? What is wealth? Wealth is money, you know. Do we get any? The West Indians in St. Paul's found themselves in a strange limbo. As citizens of the new Jamaica, they lost their British status and had to reapply for the right to stay. We were abused as British citizens. We were abused. But we still fight, as Princess said. 
We fight for what we want. We get it. Throughout the 1960s, Jamaicans in St. Paul's worked hard to overcome prejudice and earn a share in the modernisation of the city. However, the area had already developed a reputation for prostitution and criminality. St. Paul's was like this for years and um, people started to blame us, the coloured people, for doing it when we are not to be blamed at all because uh, as far back as 40 years ago, the same things were happening in St. Paul's. I think the immigrant has either worsened or, or bettered this. The majority of prostitutes in St. Paul's are not are white people. In fact, I can't remember ever having dealt with a coloured prostitute. For immigrant families with high hopes of the mother country, the atmosphere of suspicion created a powerful sense of disappointment and disillusion. One must always remember that Britain, as she is, is the result of nearly 300 years of British empire. The relationship between us and the immigrant is rather strained, and this possibly is based upon the fact that they don't really trust us. Britain was built on the labour and the capital and the profits that she drew from all parts of the world. She has, I believe, a, a moral duty to rectify some of these mistakes. They haven't got to know us well enough yet. We do our best, but when you consider that in St. Paul we have uh, the Pakistani, the West Indian, the Indian, they all have their different ways of life, their different customs, and whilst we do our best to understand them, we can't by any means hope to know them well. And therefore, th there is this lack of trust between us, or between them and us. The police force are, I wouldn't say they're very bad, um, but I think they want to learn a bit more about us, because I think they turn us down too quick, just on sight. The West Indies was in fact built on people who were brought out from India, from Africa, from China to build up a sugar empire, which in, it, in its turn built up nearly every large city in England. And this was done in spite of the fact that the West Indians who were already in the West Indies were saying, we can't support this population. What would happen if sugar failed? And the British planters said, well, we have nothing to do with that. We need our money and we bring our labor in. Well, you know, don't cry if now the sugar has failed, the labour starts pouring into England. What nationality do you find are the hardest to deal with as a policeman? In St Paul, or as you say, the English. I'll be a policeman. Policeman, you? Honestly, I'll do nothing. So you don't want to do the children of the first arrivals faced a whole new set of difficulties as they entered a completely unprepared education system being taught about, about slavery in school. Teachers would tell you that you're black and you came here on this ship and you were in the hull and plenty of you died and it just, I mean, it drove me crazy anyway. I know that. So, I mean, that's the start of it for me. With us it was like, we've seen these images and we saw what happened in the slave trade, like, but we see certain things happen to the women and the people through it and think, well, you didn't fight. And the way it was taught just drove me crazy, man. I just couldn't take all, the, all, those, all my ancestors being in the bottom of that ship, just suffering and being chucked overboard. telling me that there's 1,500 of us on the plantation working. There's 20 people in a house. Yeah, but they've come down and taken your mum or your sister or your brother or your dad. Yeah, and they've been whipped to some images you've seen or they've been hung and you've walked down the road and seen them hanging from the tree. Your women are taken and raped and you know this is going on, but nobody fought. Coming to England and then being sold for fucking pennies and it just hurt so much. You're telling me nobody not once dragged a man off the horse. Yeah? Are you telling us that we actually believed we were just to be trodden on? 
and that's all we were. And that was very hard to, it made me angry. It triggered madness. It made me mad. It drove me crazy. Through that understanding made me be anti-authoritative. So if you're an authority, and it's like that, so if someone goes to touch, it's like, don't touch me, don't you think I've gone through enough? I couldn't fight then because I was in chains, but I can now. But then by going through and researching history, I found all these uprisings. Yeah, I found hundreds of uprisings from the beginning where enslaved Africans knew who they were. They didn't come from a country called slave. Yeah, they came from a country called Africa, a continent, a great continent. They came from kings and queens. They knew who they were. So they were stamped on to make them forget who they were, but they still fought for their right as human beings, which we all are. Forget race, colour, creed. We bring it to its lo lowest common denominator. We are all human beings. Throughout the 70s, St Paul's became a place of refuge, an area where West Indians could live away from Bristol's racial stress, a place where black people could live together, supporting each other. St Paul's was just the fun, it was the place to be, it was a safe home for black people. Because when you go downtown, you can get kicked in the head by a skinhead or the Hells Angel. But when you got into St Paul's, you know you were safe. If you get beat up in town, you probably know, a certain discotheque. People probably wonder what the hell you doing there anyway, boy. So, we was kind of ground to our base. You see where they have the pink building now? It was like a fence they put up there. So we couldn't cross that fence. In the 70s, here in St. Paul, there was one of a very close-knit community, whether you were white or black. Well, them times in the 70s, Rasta, anyone will tell you. It was more unity. There's a lot more togetherness, you know what I mean? We had more respect for the community, and we had more respect for each other, you know? Because that was probably the best time in St. Paul. You know, we had a stronger network of people. There was more understanding amongst the different groups of people that lived in the area. Um, it was a struggle, but, you know, there was a sense of purpose. Make we share some love. Had this kind of a next generation of elders who we can relate to. There's that, that link, there's that decency, there was that brought up scene. There's this kind of West Indian culture, you know, which was very profound at the time, which kept everybody in a certain kind of order or discipline. Right? You can, you know, smell the rice and peas. You can see people going to church dressed up in their Sunday clothes. Jamaicans were unified and the Rastafarian movement flourished among the youth in the community. Yes, the Rasta man was there. The ballhead man was there, but we all come together, you know, as one. Most Saturdays, there would be a, at least a dozen house parties. We used to live together and have a drink and have a socialise, but there was no violence as such. Have an enjoyment, smoke ganja, have a drink, dance, and those kind of things. Share some, share some love. Two places were strong to the heart of St. Paul's at that time. Black and white and a place called Bamboo Club. Well, the Bamboo Club was a little bit like um, coming off, off the Portland Square. It was a, a little bit like rabbit warrants. Down the stairs into the basement area. Bouncers there show you a membership card. On your left is the Orange Grove restaurant. The smell of the food that's coming out of there is big. Good curry goat and rice and peas. All the best food that you know. And we had a nice little bar in there. If you're not having the food, you walk past the fish tank. So people would sit around the aquarium and just gaze at the fish that come from the from the Caribbean. To the cloak room. When you got down that hallway and you turn right. And straighten yourself out, because there's mirrors around there. And you turn right, you get into the disco. In there like this and everybody's trying to dance and you're <laughs> wicked. Is this what big people do? This is just, this is just up my street. In the late 70s, the entire country suffered at the hands of a global economic downturn. You've split the workers, you've sold us out. 
unemployment uh, grew in the 70s and that affected African Caribbean people in general. As soon as you come and you recognize that, listen, these people are not going to give you jobs. They're not going to give us jobs. They're not going to give us opportunities. Not in the way that we want the opportunities. That changed the, the St. Paul's community dramatically, where a lot of people moved out, leaving behind the people who weren't doing very well for themselves. The black and white cafe was right on the front line. An invisible barrier of demarcation. A road that runs through the heart of St. Paul's where ganja was openly traded and smoked. The open selling of marijuana triggered a strong police presence in the area. This, combined with a lack of understanding from both sides, fueled further racial tensions. We had a community which was developing, you know, and then you had, you know, a breakdown in drug. The key instrument was when the Rastafari movement began to lose responsibility for itself. That's how it came to the authority now, bringing the pressure down on, on the establishment, on the owner of the cafe. Throughout England, what people ignored, you know, you know the black people, the African Caribbean people. Frustration out of people not being listened to, out of people who are actually disadvantaged, and the establishment doing very little for them. So there was like an imbalance going on, and, and probably that imbalance needed to, you know, needed some more support. Walking down the road, the policeman come up and says, "Oh." I've got you under suspicion for theft. There was a robbery down the road and you fit the description. I'm going to take you down the station, they take you down the station, they do an ID parade and the person picks you out. Once somebody picks you out on the ID parade, you're going to court. When you go to court, next places you're going to go, you're going to go to jail. You've got a criminal record, but it wasn't you. But in those days they would say, but every black man looks alike. We don't understand the police, the police don't understand us. That's madness. You can't police a community if you don't understand the culture and, uh, and the citizens of that community. You can't police the community if you're not going to make it better for the people them to live. The struggle exposed deep divisions within the community. Our parents have rejected us through the fate of Rastafari, right. through the concept of Africa to the jet pan we're here, to the black god that we praise. Our own people have rejected us at that time, early time. At that time, Nelson Mandela is in prison, so we're fighting for apartheid to be destroyed. We're fighting for all of those things. We could sit back and see that the ANC and the support that it was getting from, whether it's English, whether it's Spanish, whether it's Dutch, whether it's so that Mark Nelson Mandela could be freed, we could see all of that. But those people were so focused in on what they were doing that they didn't recognize that they were, they were the black boys or black girls or black men or black women that were being treated like that, right on their doorstep here in England or here in Bristol. They didn't notice that. But we could feel it. And the only way that we could deal with that now was to just blankly cut ourselves off from our feelings and our emotions about what our parents taught us what was right and what was wrong and we just say you know what you know what that's it we've had enough and just just went all the way down the wrong road blazing just you know, a hundred miles an hour just strange <laughs> Riot-equipped police are descending on the West Indian community in Bristol tonight to try and quell what's probably the worst street violence the city has ever seen. Hundreds of angry youths have been fighting police since early this afternoon when police tried to carry out a raid on a drinking spot. They came to the black and white to raid for drugs, which was weed. This is the first time they come in such force, for what I don't know, because the cup is open for everybody. And yeah. it's the one cup we have up here, so I don't see why they should come in such force to attack the car. 
they come in there, right? I didn't know, right? They come in and grab me up, right? Shot me in the corner, right? And say he wants to search me. Yeah, I got a warrant to search me, right? And I don't know what he's going to fucking search me for, right? We were outside waiting for the, the police because they're in there. they got to come out. But on this occasion, it fucking kicked off. And it was, trust me, there was people coming from everywhere. I mean, the police tried to drive off. The car was stoned. Police got out of the car, ran down the road. The car was turned over. Petrol cap off, rags in the petrol tank, spark it in flames. Everybody around can see that it's not happening. If they want to win that battle about the black and white, they're going to have to come heavy. <laughs> Trust me, they came heavy. The riots in St. Paul's sent out shockwaves that were felt throughout the country. Margaret Thatcher, when she won her second general election, stated that, you know, we have got to do something for the inner cities. He was throwing money at the problem. There's a lot more funding the year after the riot, you know, make the community have more resource by making the people understand that more should be done. A local development agency was created for St. Paul's, led by Kumba Balagun, a young charismatic community leader determined to spark a change. The problems have got to be solved through genuine discussion on both sides, mutual respect, mutual understanding. Even though that they supported it, I don't think that the government knew enough how to support the black community. I don't even think the local government knew how to support the black community. In 1986, the police began an apparent routine search for drugs in St. Paul's, codenamed Operation Delivery. People said to them, you come, you claim that you come to real for drugs. Now you get what you want, now leave the area. They said that they didn't want to leave the area until the area had returned to normal. And I pointed out that the only abnormality was the police presence because the other people lived there. Now, Selector, how we had some dance all thing, man. You don't know all the things that you do. I see you walking in passes and crow. Say you're a sweet lane and round avenue. Don't 21, gonna do 22. It's having some national directive. Because if you look, um, you know, recently there's been raid, you know, on, in Brixton, Answorth, and various black communities throughout the country. So I think this thing is a natural thing. I think it's been um, supported and pushed by the Home Secretary because obviously um, the general election is just around the corner and he is a platform to come back to power on, you know, this law and all the ticket. It demoralises the residents, black and white, in, in, in that community. It highlights Bristol in a very bad light and it puts the police in a situation where they're seen to be oppressing black people. It is about asserting police authority. It is about developing a style and technique of public order that is quasi-military and that is not prepared to accept a degree of community uh, uh, autonomy, that is not prepared to accept alternative lifestyles, that's about quashing dissent. Pressure mounted in St Paul's and Mr Balagun adopted a provocative stance. I believe that Operation Delivery was actually an abortion. Kawumba Balagun is no stranger to controversy. As a guest of Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, he's courted it in Bristol, he's currently embroiled in it in Belfast. It confirms the natural affinity we have 
uh, with the Irish. Uh, it is alleged that the Bristol West Labour Party has in the Bristol Evening Post been supporting IRA and Libyan terrorism. Because I would have thought that the opposition front bench would like to actually uh, deny this and actually repudiate that constituency party. Is he aware that that same Mr. Belogan, very luckily, has just been calling upon the IRA to assist the ANC just in the same way as Libya helped the IRA? Is it not essential that the Labour Party repudiates Mr. Belogan and kicks him out of the Labour Party? Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of us had stuck our necks out and made ourselves fairly unpopular, I can tell you, by saying, look, give this bloke a chance. The first thing he does is turn around and go off talking to Gerry Adams in, in Belfast. I mean, so I think enough is enough. The events of the 80s had given the community a new profile. By reaching out to Sinn Féin, Mr. Balogun placed St. Paul's in an unprecedented spotlight, connecting the community and its problems with Britain's biggest terrorist threat. So that is why now you find even the so-called drugs creep in to divide us. Yes, you had the marijuana and so on, but um, there was never no um, heroin or cocaine or none of those things within this community. The late 80s saw a massive increase in the availability of illegal drugs. St. Paul's quickly became the centre of drug trafficking for the entire southwest of Great Britain. It, it just got drugs, man. It just became an epidemic then. The front line was flooded with hundreds of drug dealers trading openly day and night. St Paul's woke up to the sound of gunfire once again this morning. A local man had been shot in the chest at the wheel of his car. He died later in hospital. Yeah, got shot maybe five times in his car. Blah, blah, blah. And the, the kid that was shooting him, shooting him, man, he was just... He was blazing that thing, man. The shooting happened outside the black and white cafe on Grosvenor Road, an area of St Paul's known as the front line. This is another step backwards for St Paul's. Police were called to Ashley Road around three o'clock this morning. A man was found in the yard behind this cafe. He'd been stabbed. This area of Bristol is back in the news again for all the wrong reasons. There's been another fatal shooting here. Forensic science officers have been at the scene of the death much of the day, looking for clues and carrying out tests. Security officers are doing a search of the area. At the moment, we're not sure what the weapon is. Evan Berry was killed in the early hours of New Year's Day, shot in the head as he tried to stop a robbery. So today, two men appeared before Bristol magistrates charged in connection with another violent death in St Paul's. The latest big Operation Atrium raid at the Black and White Cafe in St Paul's. The Atrium team's now around 70 officers strong. There have been over 450 arrests. <laughs> People are unable to walk down the streets without being accosted by these persistent crack dealers. Children cannot go out to play without seeing these crack dealers making money and driving off in expensive cars. My elders were all crackheads. If they weren't crackheads, they were probably selling it. But my age bracket were mostly crackheads. They smoked crack. You know, we were caught, my age were caught with the, with the um, not really knowing about it. You know, now everyone look crackhead. You're a crackhead. In my day, it wasn't that. It was like, he smoked crack, you know, like, yeah. It was like, a, 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 yeah, not a good thing, but you know what I mean? It wasn't a bad thing. You get me? Back in the day, you could only go and get your drugs from St. Paul's. No matter which part of Bristol you come from, you have to go to St. Paul's. And we're talking about not just Bristol now, we're talking about the surrounding places as well. In the midst of this drug boom, the Aggie Crew was born. A gang that dominated the city's drug trade throughout the 90s, controlling the distribution of drugs across the southwest of England. Clinton, known as King Aggie, was the head of the gang. I was the, the leader of my friends. I was like 19. The guys below me were like 16 or 17. And no one around us showing us how to make money except for 
The only people we seen with money was the drug dealers on the front line. We just came out there and followed what was happening out there already. The only thing we done different is we came out there in numbers, but as one, you know? So if we had any trouble out there, we would all step to the trouble immediately. There wouldn't be no um, one, one on once. So within, I would say a couple months of being out on the front line, we was feared. King Aggie became a symbolic figure, a leader who commanded respect and loyalty throughout the front line. That was the aura, you know, that we stick together and no matter what, like, the, there was guys that was meant to be gangsters above us, you know what I'm saying? Like, the ones we looked up to as the, as the guys like you don't mess with, you know what I'm saying? They wouldn't step to us because they knew we'd all smooth. And that was the thing about it, the unity, you understand? And that was the, that was the most frightening thing for the police. It wasn't that, the, it wasn't that we selling drugs. Everyone's selling drugs on the front line. It's not just us. Why would they want to get us the most out of everybody? Why would they want to get us off the road? Do you understand? It's because they know it's unity. Do you understand? And unity means power. The Agiku became rich and famous with more money than they could spend they soon became a police priority. As young ghetto youths, once you get to that level, you just end up buying more cars and more clothes and more gold. Do you understand? Because that's your level what you're thinking. You know, by 99, 2000, I was a stressful human being. You know, I needed to go to the jail. Definitely. Go to prison for 10 years, you get 10 years in prison, you get a lot of time to, to grow up, you understand? And at the end of the day, those things can only go on for so long, you know? Like, I'm not gonna lie, I should have finished with it a long time ago anyway, and just got out of it, and, and that's, honest to God, that's what I wanted to do, as a youth. You know, I didn't want to do it, keep doing it, keep doing it, shit. You know what I mean? I got to a pinnacle where, you know, and I, I needed to come out of it, you understand? But as a young, Ghetto youth, the way that they train your brain in St. Paul's, you understand? You can't really see further than that. You can only see the, the people who's made it to you still go on the front line. You're thinking that they've made it. They ain't made shit. But because they got the bimmer with the, with, the, with the drop top and all the gold and you know they're fat, they got cash, you think they made it, you understand? But they ain't made shit, you know? So you just try to get to there. Once you're there, you're looking for something else now, but there ain't no one around you because you're the highest man around. There ain't no one there to show you nothing else. Do you understand? So the only thing you do now is continue, continue and continue. You know, and you know it's going down because I knew I was going to prison. But you make a bit of fool, mama tell you self you calm Only now you want so you bad from your man Never wear a clubs when them ring the alarm In 1998, the leading members of the Aggie crew were arrested and jailed The imprisonment of the Aggie crew created a power vacuum on the front line News travelled fast to Jamaica Within weeks, a new wave of young Jamaicans known as Yardies had arrived in St Paul's when I came here, I think I see a couple of thousand Jamaicans. It's like when I when I go to the front line, it's like I was in Jamaica. So the boys that are coming here now to, to take over or to, to earn that money, they do it different. The Yardies transformed the drug economy. Mixing crack and heroin into heavily addictive snowballs, they quickly expanded their client base. The frontline trade boomed, and in the first year, the Yardi sent more than ten million pounds of profit back to Jamaica. Boom. So you're better than the rest of them. Than the rest in 2003, the Guardian newspaper reported the return of the Aggies to St Paul's. The Aggie are like each other, are they loyal to the King Aggie? While King Aggie was still in jail, some of his crew were released. They wanted their turf back. They offered the Yardies a deal. If they wanted to stay and work in St. Paul's, they would have to pay a tax of £50 per person per day and £100 to run a business. 
To make the point, they robbed every Yardie in the bar. Later, they tried to provoke the Yardies into a full-scale firefight. The turf war exploded. Three days of violence, kidnapping, gunfire and intimidation. The police were overwhelmed and for the first time in mainland Britain, armed police officers were deployed to patrol the streets. The conflict ended with the Aggies were arrested for violating their parole and sent back to jail. The Yardies were left to control the front line once again. Everything changes, the people change. You have the um, predominantly um, Muslim community at the moment in St Paul's. You have the Eastern Europeans, you have a few Jamaicans, I have to say, you have a few, of, everybody is still here, but not in a mass quantity of in like the 1970s, 80s, or even in the 50s. Once again, a new wave of immigrants continue to settle in St. Paul's. But the greatest change may be yet to come, as a new half a billion pound shopping centre has been built right next to St. Paul's. Temples at the moment is like Notting Hill, yeah? It's like a gold mine, yeah? Because of Broadmead, yeah? And it's like all the people in that move out of Notting Hill, move out the area and you get all these rich, hippie, yuppie people coming in. St. Paul's is being developed, but at the same time, most of the Jamaicans, most of the black people is being moved out the area. In, in one sense, that is development, but in another sense, that is a legacy which is being broken, which is lost because of lack of understanding. Black and white doesn't exist anymore. That's a block of flats. Um, Grosvenor Road has changed. I mean, everything has changed 500% man. Dude. The only thing that hasn't changed for us is the, or the black peoples that live in the community is the opportunity, the opportunity for employment, good employment. The structures of St. Paul's are changing still there is a connection with the turbulent period of the past and young people just have to live with it. Everyone in St Paul's knows somebody who's financially stable through drugs. I could point out six people that made it through drugs and they did yeah, I can't really point out a lot of people that made it to that level. Legally, you see people older than you, yeah? Who say, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that and they're still in the same place as you. So wait there, if you're broke now, you're a big man, you're broke, you're in the same position as me, you're in the same place as me, and you were doing everything I wanted to do, then I'm trapped. Youngsters in the community are growing up in a confusing environment. They are even presented with conflicting versions of their own history. People have, this is our truth, that this is our truth, that I don't want to hear nobody's truth. I was one of those kids. I was proud to be part Caribbean. I was ashamed to be anything African because all I knew of Africa was enslavement, hanging and weakness, yeah? The truth is it's strong and it was powerful, but that was the information I was taught. I've heard so much things about my history right now. Some of it sounds horrible, some of it sounds nice, but there's too much stories, yeah? So I went looking and researched a lot of stuff. All I saw was the slave trade and what came from that. And for me, it made me feel that there was a, a seed into what I could achieve. I don't listen to nothing. I locked that all off. All that's left for me to do is go to Egypt, go to Africa, explore and see what ties to it and what doesn't. It made me carry shame to believe that this happened and nothing really came from it. And this was all the history is. But then if you actually research the history and see what greatness came from Africa and see what Africa gave to the development of civilization, then it frees you from the mental bondage that a limited knowledge could hold you in. This exploration into their history is empowering the young people of St. Paul's to reclaim their identity. We can, we can debate the facts, yeah, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, yeah, I'm, I'm African, I'm, I'm happy with who I am, I'm Dwayne, I'm, I'm human, and that, that's what it's all about, isn't it? that's what matters. I'm a Maori, I'm African, you hear me? Because I haven't forgotten myself. A lot of people, you grow up and you forget who you are, like, I'll never forget, so I'm trying to say, I know what my people's been through, 
where we came from and where we need to go. On knowing myself, I know what my aims are. I, I don't feel that I have any other competition or anything holding me down but myself. And That's what keeps me strong every day. Like There's nobody who can take away who I am right now because I'm so sure of who I am and why I'm here. I'm awake, but have you really seen me wake up and stand up and see the giant in me? The St. Paul's of today has a second front line. A place where the strength of gangs, the unity and shared identity is being reinvented for a new purpose. The I Am Entertainment crew is now established as an example of constructive progress. We just got our own team and we, we, like, we do a lot of things. We make our own music, we make our own videos, we, we, we distribute it our own ways, we make the most profit our own way. Bold t-shirts advertise the miracle around Bristol and at home. A miracle of self-belief, ambition and creativity. There's nothing negative. Every aspect of what we're doing and what we are is positive. And if we can pass that on, then that's a miracle. He's got a distinction in, from the rock school with music, that's a miracle. This man passed this thing in business on advance, that's a miracle. This man here works with youth, big youth worker and makes films. I and mean, when his brother does straight out Bristol graphic design, that's a miracle. The older guys in the crew guide, promote and introduce youngsters around the community. This is a magazine clipping of some shoes. I did. It's leaking into my, the actual image of the boots and I'm supposed to advertise the boots. Is that how you going on, yeah? Like you got them positive models here. Eh? Mm. That was just a quick thing still. I like how you be listening. We can represent you with your I Am t-shirt. You'll know you're being promoted. Like, I Am Entertainment is like, I Am Me in it. It's yours. It's your yourself representing yourself. And like, it's kind of like that stage where you're prepared to go out there and shine and show yourself. Music is like the best way of getting across a message. But some people choose to send the wrong message. So, that's kind of how we need to keep our game. You know what I'm saying? You need to be real to your environment. There's no point in us kind of going and jumping on a message that doesn't fit us. Why not make a song about how you got out of the area, how you got rich, how you how you did, how you helped the community? Being humble and taking criticism, and there's gonna be some of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But you got it. You got it. It's all talent. I'm showing the youth a new way in it. I'm saying you don't you don't have to be typical. You don't have to do what's expected of you, that there's opportunity. I'm not gonna go around to have people needing me. I'll go around to try to empower people. So even the day I'm gone, you still have younger youths growing up that's better than me, like me, advance and doing more better things. You see what I'm trying to say? I'm just a start of a legacy right now. You see what I'm trying to say? This is only the beginning. of them will look at us and say yeah that's what we're talking about like they look at us and say yeah all that time that they struggled for and they fight it for is now coming through in me and all the younger peers they put all their time effort all of their knowledge into us until we become more you can't give up you keep on fighting you drop stand back up that's that's the bottom line i'm a warrior and i'm showing you what we do in it i rest at nothing i stop at nothing 
until I get what's needed. Yeah, so you have the map of Ethiopia. Our land Shashaman is right here. You know, so I'm trying to say like I'm the end of all suffering now. I'm just that warrior right now for my people that's just carrying out what I need to carry out. Different sounds, baby things have changed. 